All right. So um, again, happy Saturday, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the 2020-2021 program for the Engineer in Residence orientation. So I'm going to jump right in just to give you an idea of what to expect for today. Um, of course, I'll do a little introduction for those of you who um, might not know me. Um, and then our goals for today are really to give you an overview so you know what to expect. We're going to talk about some practical um, tips and tools. Um, and then we will set aside some time um, for a bit of a break. And also during that break time, I will be encouraging you to um, connect up with your match. If you're both on the call today, if you both plan to attend, it's a great time to just give each other a call and get the ball rolling. Um, and then, um, as I said, we're here uh, to answer any questions you might have. So what does that look like? So we're gonna do the introduction to the program. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, engineering messages, talk about lesson plans. Um, we're gonna um, dip into some uh, advice from, from some of the experienced um, program participants that we've collected over the years. Uh, talk about next steps, have that little break I mentioned, and then we'll do that. We'll keep time for a Q&A and a wrap up. Uh, by the way, please enjoy the photos that you see on the slides. I tried to throw in, these are real um, examples of, you know, that have been snapped in different um, events that have happened over the years. So uh, please feel free to enjoy those photos and maybe it'll trigger some inspiration for you as well. So um, what is an EIR? What is the EIR program? What is, the, what is this all about? So an EIR, or that's what we have sort of affectionately like to re uh, refer to them as, our engineer in residence volunteers. Um, an EIR is many things. Um, you can think of it almost as wearing different hats. Um, so it's you know, you can turn it can turn into someone who becomes a role model, an ambassador for the engineering profession or STEM professions, someone that's breaking down stereotypes. They're an ally for teachers. Um, they're an engineer who cares. And that's really um, kind of to, speaking to the fact that these are folks that that are trying to go above and beyond and give back. And they're really passionate about the profession. And they're an example. Uh, they're exam an example of what's possible. They have their own stories to tell. They have their own experiences. Um, they're this bridge between what's going on in the classroom and the curriculum and all the learning happening there and what that can turn into. So the program itself, um, this is sort of our standard verbiage. If you visit the, web if you visit the website, you will see there. Uh, it's an innovative volunteer-based program that is designed to inspire young people in the areas of science, technology, engineering, and math, so STEM. Um, and we're so grateful to have so many passionate volunteers that uh, make up this program, that really make this possible. Uh, there's about 200 of you this year, um, so you're part of something big when you're in this program, so welcome. Um, you know, you're here because you've been matched with, um, as a teacher, you've been matched with an engineer and vice versa, an engineer that's been matched with a teacher, but please know that you're really part of this um, network now. We're, we're a full support system and we love to help each other. So you have lots of resources at your disposal. This program's been around for quite a while now. Um, back in 1997, there was a conversation that happened between um, uh, the then president of PEO and um, uh, a fellow who was really passionate about um, uh, sort of giving back and fostering these types of um, these types of uh, programs. And this idea was born of what if we put an engineer into a classroom and went beyond the um, sort of in and out style of model. 
So the name of the program, Engineer in Residence, is very um, deliberate and strategic. The engineer is, is designed to become a resident in the classroom. They're not just in, do a flashy uh, experiment or something and then leave. They're there to really um, create impact, um, open minds, uh, and and all you know all those things that that we kind of already talked about. Um, so this this program was founded by uh, PEO Professional Engineers uh, in Ontario. So uh, each provincial each province in Canada um, is regulated by a provincial regulator so for engineers. So here in Ontario, that's the Professional Engineers of Ontario, um, and they're all. Um, uh, sort of overseen or governed or uh, directed by uh, Engineers Canada. Um, and so PEO um, really wanted to, um, you know, think about how they could advocate for the profession. And we're so fortunate and grateful that, that they were so forward thinking and innovative all the way back in 1997 to realize the importance of talking to kids as young as kindergarten about engineering and just get those conversations started. Um, so now um, we are the ones that are running the engineering residence program, we being engineers of tomorrow. Um, so lots of you know reasons behind why that's happened, but we are um, really fortunate and again grateful that PEO has trusted us with the um, continuing on the legacy of this of this program. Uh, and we're really committed to honoring the roots of the design of the program. It's it's just um, so beautifully designed in so many ways, which I'll, you'll see as we get into it. Um, and then an important thing that um, I'm sure all of you have uh, already figured out, but the EIR program is offered free of charge to elementary and secondary schools in Ontario. So Accessibility is one of the things that we that that is a value to us. So, um, making this program free of charge, not um, causing any other burdens on the education education system or the teachers or the students, is really important to us. So, some of the core values that um, that we talk about when we're um, introducing new people to the engineer in residence program. Um, experiential, inclusive, and real, and I hope you appreciate the acronym lines up with EIR. <laughs> um, so experiential, because we're really, our ultimate goal is to create positive engineering experiences for students. That's it. So it's really important to keep that in mind um, and keep coming back to that because we can get really hung up on um, you know, how many popsicle sticks do I need for a particular activity or how, how much time or how do I do this or how do I do that or we get really busy. Um, so we do our best to keep that um, uh, top of mind that really our ultimate goal is just to create positive engineering experiences for students. We are not going out and trying to convert every student into um, a little mini engineer. We just want them to open their minds to what might be possible. Maybe think about it in a way they've never thought of it before. It doesn't mean they're going to choose engineering as a career when they um, when they have to make that decision necessarily. Um, but it also um, just will have an influence on their perception of engineering um, as they go through life. And we really believe that having that sort of general public that is really um, literate and understanding of what engineers do is going to be good for the, you know, our society. Um, and then inclusive. So we really also know that there is huge value in having a diverse set of thinkers to solve the complex problems of the 21st century. Engineers solve problems. 
And <laughs> the easy ones have been solved already. So the ones that are left to solve are the really challenging, really complex problems. And so we can't think about these things in the same way we've always, always done. So in order to um, change things up, we really need that diversity of thinkers. And so that's why for us, it's really important that we reach that diverse audience and, and um, help them understand what engineering is about so that then that can translate into a more diverse engineering population. And then real. So we're real people, real um, real engineers, real students, real teachers. Um, and so it's really, as I mentioned, this bridge between what's going on in the classroom, um, the learning that's happening, the curriculum that's being covered, and then connecting that to a real live person, someone that's relatable, someone they can connect to. Um, and, you know, they can see it's maybe it's not so far out of reach, or maybe it's not what I expected. Or, you know, this is someone in my community that lives around me and knows about the the things that are important to us so it can really make it real for the students. So here's a quick timeline of um, the engineer in residence program. So going back to 1998 was when the actual pilot began. Um, it was five schools in in the Toronto area that started. Um, and then it grew from there. So you can see the numbers there, 14 schools, 75 schools, 90 schools. Um, and then we actually took uh, the program over, um, well, we came on board with PEO to um, support the program in uh, 2015. So we were really proud of jumping from uh, 90 schools in 2015 and getting that up to 170 schools in 2016. And then we've just been sort of hovering around that. 200 mark now for the last few years. Um, so, you know, and it continues to build. The new um, innovation, I'll say, that we're piloting this year um, is virtual pairs. Now, let me explain, because really, I know at the moment, everyone's a virtual pair. Um, but before we had to make that decision and make that pivot, um, we were trying to solve one of our own problems with the program was which is just geography, finding engineers that are geographically um, located close to the schools that want to have, or in the teachers that want to have um, an engineer visit their class. And so uh, to solve that problem, we were um, going to pilot moving this program to a virtual platform. Um, so we did do that. We do actually have 10, uh, virtual matches. So the engineer is not geographically close to their school. They are fully intending to do the program 100% virtually, even if we didn't have COVID going on. Um, and so for us, that's really, it, it's a really exciting year to see that we've added this new element to the program. We're going to be paying close attention to how all of this works out this year. And hopefully that will be one of the keys to unlock scaling this program even further across Ontario. Um, okay, so here's some stats. I know we have um, a good mix with us today of engineers and teachers. So um, I know I know the engineers love the numbers and, and teachers. I hopefully you will appreciate this as well. Um, so this is what it looks like. Um, at the moment, we have 76 of our volunteers that are P engines. So that means they've graduated, they've graduated from an accredited um, university engineering program, and they've gone on to get their actual license from uh, Professional Engineers Ontario. So they've had to um, do the uh, put in experience, four years of, of experience under a under an engineer working under an engineer, and then they've had to um, write an exam on top of that. Um, and then 24% of our volunteers are EITs, and that stands for Engineers in Training. And that's just another program that uh, Professional Engineers Ontario has available for um, students that have graduated from um, an accredited uh, engineering program and are in the process of getting their license. So because it does take quite some time to get your license, um, these are the folks that are in the process of doing that and definitely have valuable experiences to share with um, with everyone. So that's what that makeup looks like. 
And then in terms of the gender balance, which is something we um, do pay close attention to, um, in particular with engineers, uh, we have 73, well, for this coming year, we have 73% of our volunteers that are male and 37% of our volunteers that are female. Um, so you might think there's a little ways to go still to get to that um, gender balance, the 50-50, but we're actually quite proud of this number. Uh, in Canada, the percentage of engineer of licensed engineers that are female is only 18 percent so we're doing much much better than the general population of engineers in in canada um, so again we're, we're pretty proud of that um, and we are um, always actively working to um, to uh, improve that uh, improve that uh, gender balance and I'll go into some more details as we get through the slides on the work that we're doing um, around equity diversity and inclusion and how we're um, trying to access a really a more diverse population more broadly um, okay so calendar for the year so just what to expect um, kind of to give you a general sense of the, the chronology of the program. So what you've already experienced in May and June is when we were doing all of our recruiting and our matching process. So that happens along with um, throughout the summer, um, doing police checks and trying to get all the logistics um, taken care of. And then in July and August is when we do our summer training webinars. Um, so if you missed that or you weren't able to attend those, um, again, we did record them. They're available. I'll show you where you can find them. And then right now we're doing orientation, scheduling first visits, planning, getting thing, everything all set up and ready to go. And then really throughout the year, so October through to April, we'll be doing check-ins. You'll see some emails come through from me. Um, I, I really try my best not to um, spam you or flood your inbox, um, so it'll be occasional. You'll see something come through from me just in terms of updates, or um, sometimes I just get a really awesome resource that comes through my inbox and I want to share, so I might push out an, um, an e-blast to everyone just to let you know. So it's just communication and making sure everything is working smoothly. Um, we'll do some surveys to collect some feedback from you, that sort of thing. And then um, in April, uh, April, May, that's when we sort of switch gears again to get ready for, we start getting ready for the next program year. So the 21-22 program year. So we will we'll call everybody up. Um, we'll find out what you wanna do for the, the following year. So um, there's no need to like reapply if, you are, if you're already in the program and you wanna stay on for the next year, you just need to let us know. Um, we'll collect receipts. We do our recruiting and ramp up for that, that going back into that recruiting process in May. Um, this is another, uh, again, some numbers for everyone, just to give you a sense of the distribution that we have across the province. So with the, um, with, uh, the way that PEO, Professional Engineers Ontario, divides up their members, is by um, region. So um, each engineer is uh, licensed to a, per not licensed to, but is, um, what's the word? Like you, when, you, when you get your license, you belong to a particular uh, chapter. And so it's really nice for us in terms of visibility. There's um, contacts at PEO chapters that we talk to a lot to help us find more volunteers. So in terms of the way the program's organized, we like to mirror the PEO chapter system because it gives us a really nice visibility across Ontario of what that spread looks like um, and how to connect in those areas. So that's what you're seeing here on the um, left-hand column. These are the these are some of there's a few slides you're going to see. So these are the PEO um, chapters and regions, and then the second column is how many uh, engineers in that area have been matched. 
Um, and then how many are unmatched? So we've got some potential here maybe for filling some gaps on our wait list. Um, and then uh, how many schools in that area are unmatched? Um, so you can see, for example, in East Toronto, we have 23 matches. So 23 engineers that have been matched with 23 classrooms in that area but I still have five schools that I don't have an engineer for. So what we'll do in these cases is we'll reach out to our contacts in the East Toronto chapter, for example, um, and we'll ask if they can reach out to their member base and see if they can maybe find us a few more volunteers to fill those gaps. So that's just um, uh, giving you a sense of the activity across the province. Um, so this is the sort of east central area and the eastern area in Ontario. Uh, these numbers are showing you uh, northern. So you can see we do have some opportunity in the northern area to build our, um, our program up there. The numbers are a bit lower than the other regions. Um, west central, the, the activity that's happening in the west central region. Uh, and then the Western region, um, what's going on there? So as I, oh, uh, oh yeah, that's it. So as I mentioned, there's, um, I think at the moment we are at like 202 matches for this year. Um, that number bounces around a little bit over the next few months as things get finalized. But um, uh, it's a, you know, again, you're you're part of something big here. So I really encourage you to reach out and um, and connect. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking for a minute because I've been uh, hurling a ton of information at you and would love to see some engagement. Um, so use the chat box and if you're an engineer, would love to just see some commentary around uh, why you chose to, to participate in the program, why do you want to be an EIR and from the teachers that are with us today um, would love to hear from you about um, why do you want an engineer in your class or an EIR in your class. I'll just read some of them out as, as hopefully a bunch of you are furiously typing your responses. Uh, so Brian says he wants to give back to the community, especially and uh, help to inspire black students to become engineers. Aisha uh, wants to encourage girls to go into STEM careers. Uh, Adrian is a teacher. Hi, Adrian. You want to give exposure to career options. Jeffrey wants to excite and expose younger students to science and technology. Ali's uh, an EIR. As a woman in engineering slash construction, I am passionate about increasing diversity in the fields. Uh, Daniel wants to integrate some new STEM activities in the classroom with a kindergarten class in Toronto. That will be fun. Bruce says, as an engineer, I want to give back to the community. Uh, I also love engineering and want to let people know about it. One of the things we like to say about the engineering profession is that it's a bit of a stealth stealth profession. And, um, you know, engineers work behind the scenes a lot of time. So it's great when we can kind of put a face to the profession. Sarah's saying, I think it's great for the kids to talk with someone that is active in the field and they can see the love for learning from someone other than their teacher. They have uh, answers for the questions. We really hope that we can be that resource for the students, Sarah, um, and be that kind of um, light bulb that goes off for them that says, oh, that's why I need to learn all this stuff. <laughs> Uh, 
Uh, Jeff is saying, I love what I do, but way back as a younger kid, I had very little sense of what mechanical engineers do. I want youth to know the breadth of opportunities that are out there. Yes, I would say that um, generally speaking, eng the engineering profession has not done the best job of marketing itself <laughs> or there's room for improvement maybe we'll say so this is an excellent opportunity to to um to correct that uh, i want to increase females in stem i'm a uh, female engineer i wanted to be a role model for young people in stem specifically encourage young girls to get into engineering and stem roles Lots of great responses here. Oh, thank you so much for your engagement too. Brittany says, I'm excited to be able to provide my students with real life problem solving experiences and widen their understanding of career options. I hope everyone feels they could pursue an, a career in engineering. We hope so too, Brittany. That is one of our goals to let everyone know that there's a place for you in engineering. Um, and really like how you brought the real life problem solving into it. Again, that's one of our best practices is, is making the um, activities or the experiences that are, are being designed relevant to the real life of these students. Tom is saying, I stumbled into the profession because I liked science and was good at math, but it has been one of the luckiest decisions I ever I, I, I made as every day is very interesting, yeah. That's something we hear uh, very often, uh, Tom. Um, people go into engineering because they're good at math and science and they really don't know what's possible or the, the paths they can take or what's available. And so luckily it's a good choice, right? <laughs> okay, feel free to keep chatting on in the, um, in the chat box there. I'm going to keep moving along. So some of the other goals, these are just sort of broad goals that um, we at Engineers of Tomorrow and definitely um, the Engineer in Residence program are really um, leading towards. Um, so changing the public perception of engineering and tech careers and educating the general public. So I talked a little bit about, a little bit about that already. Um, not necessarily everyone is going to go into engineering. That's okay. But having a general public that understands that um, we have these folks called engineers and this is what they do and this is how we need to engage with them and this is how you know they can solve problems for us, that just benefits everyone. Um, we also are looking to break stereotypes, raise awareness, enhance the public profile of engineering professions. So there's lots of um, uh, comments in the in the chat box there about wanting to um, uh, help more girls understand. Uh, lots of females that are in the profession right now, they had their own experiences as they were kind of going through the system and, and they want to um, change that for the next generation that's coming through. And then getting rid of the mystery around engineering. I mentioned sometimes we talk about it as the stealth profession. And, um, and creating really productive partnerships. To us, um, you know, collaboration is key. So how can we support each other to kind of um, improve the greater good? So I'll just tell you a little bit about us at Engineers of Tomorrow, just so you have some um, background on who we are and what we do. So we started actually as a venture. Um, we were incubated by Engineers Without Borders Canada um, back in 2013. Um, and we became, we, it, things went really well. It was a very successful partnership, collaboration. Um, and so out of that, we were able to um, become our own thing. We um, incorporated nationally, um, almost exactly two years ago today. <laughs> um, and so we've been continuing on with the work that we, we started when we were um, working with Engineers Without Borders Canada. And so what we do is we partner with uh, engineering companies, professional associations like PEO. Um, we've done some work with uh, OSET, the Ontario Association of Certified Engineering Technicians and Technologists, um, and educators. And 
our goal is to transform the engineering profession. So more diversity, thinking about, you know, how we're learning from failure, being innovative, innovative and solving these um, important complex problems of the 21st century. Um, so for us, the how behind, how do we get to that is uh, engineering outreach. So we really believe in the power of this model of STEM outreach or engineering outreach um, in our case. And so that's that's and that's why we do it, too. That grassroots model of engaging volunteers to bring their stories to the next generation just has so many pluses, so many value adds. And so we think that by shaping the public's perception of engineering, that we can change its future. Uh, sometimes we'll say that what we do is is tell better stories about uh, engineering or the engineering profession today so that uh, we can have an impact on the future. And so hello, <laughs> there's me. I, I have my camera on too, so you guys can see me. Um, but uh, so this is our, our EIR team at the moment. Um, so engineers of tomorrow uh, team that's supporting the EIR program. Um, you probably um, had some communication over the summer with either Ali or um, Matthew. So those were our co-op students that we, we bring on every summer some co-op students to help us out because it's a super busy time for us. And I don't know if we're lucky or just maybe we're just living under a lucky star, but I swear we get the best co-op students every year. They're so amazing. Um, but they have gone back to school now. Ali and Matthew are both studying engineering at the University of Waterloo. So we wish them all the best. Um, um, so at the moment, uh, you have myself, um, and I studied chemical engineering at uh, Queen's University, um, and I am now living in Orangeville. I have three kids that are all currently in um, the education system themselves. I have one in grade five, grade seven, and grade nine this year. Um, and I have been with Engineers of Tomorrow since 2016, I think. <laughs> um, and then our founder, Erica Lee Garcia, um, she studied uh, manufacturing engineering at Queen's University as well. She is currently living in Waterloo. She has two daughters and is expecting a third. Um, you may notice that we both attended Queen's University, and yes, that actually is where we met. So our and um, interesting tidbit, we actually met because we both worked at a STEM camp at Queen's University called Science Quest. So Erica actually hired me for my first, um, my first job at Science Quest um, after first year finished in the summer. That's what I decided to do. Uh, and then we went our separate ways and worked in industry for many, many years uh, and have now come back to our roots, so to speak. So that's our faces. So you can see us. And as I said, please reach out to us at any time. We are always accessible and we want to support you in any way that we can. OK, so here's the big question. Um, what do we do with a class? Right. We're here to figure that out. So the beautiful, I think one of the most beautiful, beautiful things about the way the engineer in residence program is designed is that it's flexible. It's not prescriptive. We're not going to come and tell you, you must do A, B, C, D. We're going to tell, we're going to give you tools. We're going to give you resources. We're going to give you support. We're going to give you ideas and inspiration, but really that flexibility um, allows you to, as a teacher and as, a, as an engineer, to kind of take ownership and make it your own. Um, and that just drives engagement and improves the experience for the students even more. So that's why it's really up to you. You get to decide what you want to cover. So teachers, that means that as you're planning out your, your year um, at the moment, or maybe you've done this already, kind of been working on this over the last few weeks, when it, where there's particular uh, curriculum areas that you want to involve your engineer in, then you need to let them know and say, hey, like, can you find an activity that would support this part of the curriculum? Um, and engineers, if there's a particular 
um, subject or topic that you feel really passionate about and um, you want to share that excitement with the students, you need to communicate that with your teachers so that together you can figure out how to integrate that and bring that um, to the students. And so having that room for that creativity um, can really just enhance everyone's experience. Um, so yeah, so lessons can support the curriculum um, or, and as I said, or they might be something that uh, is just of interest to the EIR or your background that you really want to um, support. Uh, I did want to add in a, a bit of a flag here or a highlight that we know that the um, there was a change to the curriculum. So we know that coding now has been added in down to grade one to the curriculum. So I just wanted to flag that here because teachers, this might be an opportunity where um, you know, this is some maybe this is something new to you. You don't have experience with it or just want some extra support in this area. Your EIRs are here to help. So reach out to them and maybe there's something they, that they can do to help with that um, new addition to the curriculum. Um, we have a program guide. So um, I, I, you should have received in that like first email you got from us where, we, where you were matched up. Um, I think there was a link to the program guide. If not, I'll show you where you can find it. But um, it's good to have a place to start, right? So our EIR program guide is an excellent place to start. You can download it online. There's a ton of different activities, lesson plans in there. Um, and, and it's all linked up with the um, messaging that, that we recommend and it's all broken down. I'll show you some examples of that. Uh, and then what else can, can EIRs do with the class? Well, you can get creative. Um, you don't just have to do things with a class. Maybe you wanna help run an extracurricular program. Um, for example, a coding club or FIRST Robotics. I know that we have um, some of our EIRs that are returning this year that in the past have run FIRST Robotics teams. Um, we've seen EIRs in the past be um, mentors or judges for design competitions that schools have done. Um, science fairs, that sort of thing. Uh, we've even seen, uh, when it's been allowed, we've seen our um, engineers work with teachers and organize field trips to where to, to their places of work. So the possibilities are almost limitless <laughs> within the parameters we're working with. Um, so all that to just say that it's really um, a time to, to get creative. Don't think that, uh, think outside the box a little of what could be possible. So of course, we know that this year things are different. Um, so in particular with the um, new parameters we're working with, with for COVID-19, it's going to be really important to, um, to keep that, the lines of communication open. So some of the um, suggestions we have for this in terms of logistics with, with the EIR program and COVID-19 in mind. So set up expectations with your partners. So your um, engineer and your teacher. Um, how often are you going to meet? Um, how is that going to work? Are you going to be doing live video calls, recorded videos, or something else that works for you? And then how are you going to come up with the relevant content and activities together? So I have seen examples where an engineer will sit down with their teacher at the beginning of the year and map the whole year out. And that's one way of doing it. And it works well for that partnership. Others want to do it, kind of chunk it out and do it um, month by month or visit by visit sort of thing. Um, so that's just some suggestions from us. Uh, think about um, methods of communication and frequency. We know that when you have um, pins in your calendar, when you have blocks in your calendar, and you know you have a meeting coming up with your teacher, with your engineer, that that, um, that motivates actions, right? So think about how often you want to do that, get those meetings in your calendar if you can, and what works for you. Um, for the engineers, really, Think about how you can be supporting some uh, sort of experience that's engaging. And we're just seeing uh, society-based programming. I'm going to go into more on kind of the messaging there, but 
Um, we really, this idea of going beyond the activity to creating an overall experience for the students that's relevant and real and relatable is really important. Um, and there's another link to our website for inspiration. And then please, I can't stress this enough, but you need to let us know if something is going wrong or not unexpected or just you're not sure of something. There's 200 of you engineers and 200 of you teachers and there's only a few of us so i can't see what's going on at all times and so i need you to tell me if there's something unusual that's happening all right so next big question we have is how do i teach an engaging lesson actually maybe let me just pause for a sec i'm going to just check on the chat is did i miss some okay I'll just see if I've got any questions going. No, nope. okay. Okay, so how do I teach an engaging lesson? So with uh, COVID-19, this is going to look different than it has every other year we've done the program, but that's okay. So the good news is, um, the good news teachers is that you're part of a program that's made up of hundreds of natural born problem solvers. <laughs> Engineers love to solve problems. We just have some new parameters to work with now. So um, we and we can figure that out. So we actually did a whole uh, webinar a couple weeks ago now on virtual connections. So again, this goes above and beyond just what activities to do, although I know that's going to be top of mind for most folks. Um, but but going into how to actually connect with students when you're um, dealing in the like working in the virtual environment and how to just avoid some of the common challenges that we see when it comes to virtual connections. Um, we fortunately have some experience in this um, when the schools shut down in March or when they moved to distance learning back in March of 2020. We actually saw that about 20% of our volunteers continued to interact or engage with their classes in some way. So what we've done is we've gone back to those folks and we've really leaned on them to say, hey, what did you do? What worked for you? What were some of your challenges? Um, and then we've done some more research on top of that um, because obviously everyone's in the same situation. And so we put package that all together to some into some tips and tricks and tools um, in that virtual connections webinar so i strongly recommend that you check that webinar out if you haven't done so already refer back to it if you need to i will be sharing all of these slides so that's a clickable link if you want to find it that way um, and it's on our youtube channel which um, i'll show you where you can find that as well um, so that's changes just as we lead into this idea of um, how to you know how to um, uh, put together a, an activity or a lesson plan for uh, the program so here's just a breakdown an, an anatomy of a lesson that we like to call it um, when it comes to what it sort of looks like when you're um, doing a visit and when I so when I say visit just please know I'm speaking about virtual visits this time um, and so what your lesson is going to look like obviously you want to ca catch pe people's attention so you want some sort of hook then we're going to do some development build up some learning some maybe some review of information you might have talked about previously and then the doing so whatever that is with the activity and then there I, I think this is really important to point out but there needs to be time for some um some work that happens or some um, some connections that happen after the actual doing. So that's where we can really bring in linking things together to engineering with real world examples or personal experience. And then it, and then that closure. So a debrief, lessons learned, um, let's talk about our experiences. This is going to be particularly important in the virtual environment because we need that feedback. Like what, like what worked well for you today, students? What parts did you like? What did you not like? What can we do better next time? Um, and again, check out the website for um, 
some of the resources that we have available. Um, and, and again, don't be afraid to get creative. There's so many, just, just Googling things. There's so many great, um, inspirations out there that with just a few tweaks, you can turn into something that will um, work within the parameters we're working in at the moment. Um, so what I'm going to do is actually show you the, um, I'm going to show you the website. So let me just, Okay, I just flipped over to the website. Are you all seeing this okay? Just just drop something in the chat that makes so I know that you're seeing my screen. So oh yeah, I think you are. I think yep. it's working. Awesome. Okay, so this is the um eir.ca uh website. Um if you've been to it before, it, it looks a little different. Um we've been doing some background work on um, on the website. So don't don't worry if things look a little different. Um, we're always trying to improve. So um, so so don't be surprised when uh, when you see something a little bit different. But I wanted in particular to point out the EIR resources page. So now you'll find it right at the top menu bar. Um, and so the EIR resources, the way it's set up, there's this slider bar or this slider that you can access all kinds of different awesome resources so this one's on engineering messaging we're going to be talking about that a little later in the presentation this is a really neat video if you need to explain to someone teachers maybe if you want to explain to some of your other um it is. Some of your other teacher friends or maybe your principal wants to know what's going on. This is a really nice video that you can show them. Um, this is some this is like a one pager with some awesome recommendation tips and tricks um, to to maybe get you thinking um, uh, if you're feeling kind of stuck. These are some other activities. Uh, so links to other sites that we really love that are great for inspiration um, or just even copying what they've already done here. Um, IEEE, um, Try Engineering, Discovery has an awesome, really awesome like searchable database that's really um, great to use. Uh, this one, Tomorrow's Engineers, love the name, but uh, they've got some really great uh, downloadable and editable presentations to talk about engineering. So uh, a nice way to start the year is just to um, do a little presentation for the students on all the different kinds of engineering. So there's some really great stuff there. This is a really good article that was brought to our attention. So I try to, when I have great activities that come up, we try to just keep this page updated. Here's the program guide I was mentioning. So you can download the full program guide there. Um, there's some linkage here on curriculum alignment. Uh, full disclosure here, this one's a bit out of date. So I don't know if that one will be much value. OK, so then that's the what you can find in the slider bar. Um, as you scroll down a little further on the page, here are some of the, this is usually where we put the resources um, for the summer webinar series. So all the ones we did um, this past season, like in that Ali and Matthew did, there's links to them here. Um, I, we do need to get the one added up for the virtual webinars, so I'll make sure that that gets done. Um, there's a printable section. So um, one of our more experienced EIRs requested um, an EIR student certificate that she could hand out to all the students that, that, that were in her class at the end of the year. So we thought, why not make this available to everybody? So that's what we've done. So you can download that there. It's sort of fun. Uh, and then engineers, some uh, important to note this section on um, forms. 
So there's an activity log. So at the moment, we don't um, require you to fill this out. Um, however, it's really, really valuable information for us to know what's going on in the program. So some engineers do use this as a way to track what they're doing. I think it's really valuable for yourself as well. If you in, are intending to stay on with the program for another year, it's great to have this as a resource to refer back to year after year. Uh, and then this is the link to the reimbursement form. So super important here. So material reimbursements and police check reimbursements are accessed through this form. And then the last section is our community connections. So if you want to um, follow us on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and all those great places, um, which I highly recommend you do because we're always putting stuff up there um, to get the conversation going, get you thinking. Um, again, when I find new resources or we have all kinds of other friends that are in the STEM outreach space, if they're tweeting about cool programs or cool activities, we'll retweet them. So I um, uh, encourage you to, to uh, follow those platforms. Uh, and then the LinkedIn group. Um, we've got, I think there's about 250 members in our LinkedIn group at the moment. So it is an excellent um, place, sort of like a virtual water cooler idea, where you can go and, um, for example, if you want to find a um, an activity on space and you're stuck and you just don't know where to go, throw something up in the in the LinkedIn um, group. Say, hey, does anyone have an activity on space that, that they have done and has worked really well for this particular grade? Um, so it's designed to just be a place for everyone to be able to continue this conversation. Um, Ali's asking about resources in French. Unfortunately, we don't have those at the moment. This is something that we have struggled with. We tr have tried to get some translations um, going and it's still a gap. Um, so uh, that's something we are continuing to work on and I wish I had a different answer, but at this time, unfortunately not. All right, let me flip back to the presentation. Um, actually, before I do that, are there any other, are there any questions about the, um, about the website or the resources section. Oh, I can show you, actually, one of the things I was gonna do was show you what the activity or what the program guide looks like. Okay, so, Here we go. So there's a whole bunch of um, information in the beginning that um, is a lot of the stuff that we cover in our webinars, some of the stuff we're covering today. So it's a good place to go back and, and find that. Um, but then, so here's where we talk. See, we just talked about this, the hook, development, closure, how to plan your year, some tips. Um, here's what the activities look like. So you can see it's broken down by grade, a little description of what the activity is, assessment categories. So this one is knowledge and understanding, thinking and investigation and communication. It gives you an idea of time. How much time do you need to prep? How much time for the activity? Um, gives you the topics. So this one is good for understanding structures and mechanisms in grade one. Here are the expectations um, and then specific expectations, um, even like more detail around that. Um, and then for the materials, uh, uh, just a nice material list there. So you know what you're gonna need to go out and, and get. Um, and then here's, so it's all broken down for you in terms of that anatomy of a lesson. So here's the hook or a suggestion. Let me say an inspiration, a suggestion for the hook. Um, and then how do you develop that idea further? And then the doing, right? So this is what it's going to look like for the doing. Obviously, this was designed pre-COVID time. So in this case, the recommendation was to put students into groups for this activity. Um, however, we with COVID, we know one of the 
recommendations is that, um, or restrictions or parameters is that um, individual um, activities are going to be best or are going to work best. So engineers, that's your challenge now, figure out a new, a new way of doing this with um, individual students. And then some suggestions for how to close it off, some questions to ask. This one's pretty simple, so there's not much there. Here's a really nice one, this oil spill cleanup one. I've actually seen this one done in action at a local classroom here in Orangeville. It was a lot of fun because it's, it's a bit messy and kids love that. So if you can deal with a little bit of mess, it's really fun. So you can see just to give you a sense of how it's all broken down. Um, so have some fun, look through that. And, uh, and, and then again, use it as your inspiration and just apply some new parameters. Um, oh, and she's asking how to become part of the uh, EIR LinkedIn group. So if you just go to LinkedIn, I think if you, if you search up EIR or en engineer in residence program or EIR program, it should come up. Um, there's, if you go to the website, you should just be able to, oops, you should just be able to click the link. Oh, so, okay, you got it. Okay, excellent. Um, okay. Um, shoot, something is wrong with my slide. Let's see. Okay, sorry guys, I don't know why this isn't showing. Um, so <laughs> the idea with this slide, let me just go to the next one. Here we go. So um, I wanted to share with you some other resources or some other sources of inspiration. And these are, I've got two. So these are just ones that I, I wanted to call out. These are um, new, um, I'm hesitating to use the word partnerships because we're not formal partners with these folks, but um, but we're very closely connected with them. I just had a call um, earlier this week, actually, with Amanda and Maddie. They were both on the call. Um, and so they're doing some awesome stuff. So I wanted to, to, to give it its own slide to bring it to your attention today. So this organization is called Kids Code Jeunesse, uh, or KCJ. They have a CAN Code grant. So they are just literally trying to give as much as away for free as they can. And so they, they're doing that in all kinds of different ways. So this is a great resource if you're looking for um, something to do with coding, because this is all um, kids code jeunesse, obviously, makes sense. But I want to say, too, that it really goes beyond that. So... Um, I was chatting with an EIR earlier this week who's looking for a lesson plan around Habitat. And he went on the KCJ website and they have um, one of their scratch lesson plans that is um, about Habitat. So he's going to use the scratch platform to do a lesson on Habitat. So you can use it. It's, it's not just for coding. It's It goes above and beyond that. So here's just some of the offerings i'll say that they've they brought to our attention to say here tell tell all your engineers and tell all your teachers uh, about this stuff so they have the kcj resources so that's the lesson plans i was just referring to they have them in scratch html python microbit unplugged etc so the link is there again i'll share these slides with everyone so you can click through these links they do also teacher training again free teacher training um, and they can do private bookings. They can do it for a school or a district. Um, click through on that. Um, I have also heard that the teacher trainings that they have, like the different sessions they have available, like they do it by subject, I believe, like different, um, they have different topics maybe is a good way to say it. Um, and some of our EIRs have signed up for the teacher training and they've just said that they're they're an educator when they sign up. Um, I talked to Amanda and Maddie about this. They said it's okay. They're, they're okay with it. So don't worry if you're an, an engineer and you want to listen in on the some of the teacher training webinars that, that they offer, you can do that. Um, registration for virtual code in the classroom workshops. 
This is really awesome, you guys. I highlighted here. So they will come virtually right now to your classroom. And um, what did they say? They can visit up to four classrooms, two on each day. It's funded by CanCode. And you get to keep 10 micro bits per workshop day booked. So if you're not familiar with micro bits, they're an awesome um, little tech tool that you can use. That's a $200 value. And they're just gonna give them to you for free. Plus they're gonna deliver a workshop with your class. So again, like talk, engineers and teachers talk, think about how you can support each other, reach out to Kids Code Jeunesse, and I highly suggest signing up for one of these. Their um, CanCode grant goes until March, 2021. So try and get one of these before it's too late. <laughs> and I think what they said was they're allowed to give two sets of micro bits per school. So as long as you, you have to sign up for the workshop, um, but that means you can get up to 10 micro bits like for your school. So it could be, be like this little kit that can be used in different ways. Um, so there was that. The Code Club, so it's a separate website, but it's really run through KCJ. Um, if you want to have like, like extracurricular in the school um, or engineers, if you want to like set up a code club in your community, um, they have resources as well for that. Uh, so you can click through that link. And the really neat thing they did for us last year is if you are, if you think this is something you just might be interested in doing, they actually set up and ran a special webinar just for our EIR program participants um, on how to do this. So um, let me know if you're interested in that. I might send out a little survey to ask who might be interested in, in it. And then if we have enough people, they will um, do another webinar for us again. And then the new thing that um, just they're just launching is this Kids 2030 Challenge Overview. This is super cool. So it's something new. They're just introducing it. I think it launches October 31st is what they told me. It's 100% accessible anywhere in the world. Like it's a global thing. Um, what I really love about this particular challenge is that it's collaborative. So the way they were describing it was your data goes in and sort of becomes part of this global um, data set and you can see different, you know, all over the world where people are contributing. Um, again, it's free. <laughs> And the really neat thing, too, is it incorporates the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. So um, that's just an awesome framework that we find really effective in when we're talking to kids to connect them, the different activities we're doing. Um, like we talked about making things real and relevant. Well, the UN Sustainable Development Goals are real and relevant. They're a real problem the whole world is working on. So it's pretty neat for kids to think that they're contribu contributing to this global, um, these global um, issues. So I don't have tons of details on that because it's, like I said, it's, it's new. They're just launching it. But that's the link that they sent me. Um, you are welcome to check that out. So can't say enough good things about Kids Code Jeunesse. Oh my goodness. Oh, sorry guys, I don't know why this is. Okay, so this one is not even gonna show at all. So sorry, you have to look at a blank screen for this one. You get to look at the button that says find out more. <laughs> so the other um, partnership that I'm really excited to share with all of you today is uh, Future City. So, um, Maybe some of the teachers have heard of the Future City uh, competition before. It's hosted by Discover E. Well, hosted isn't the right word. I think it's, I'll say it's powered by Discover E. Um, but a few years ago, Engineers Canada uh, brought it to Canada. So they piloted it here in Ontario, I believe in Durham District School Board, and they also piloted it in um, PEI. Um, oh, Asia, your daughter took part in it. Awesome. Um, 
And, uh, and then, so they had, it was sort of a three-year trial that they were doing, Engineers Canada and this partnership with Discovery and bringing it to, 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 um, to this, the education system here. And it went really well. So it's a really well-designed uh, challenge. They have, I had a look through the um, website for this year. They've done an exceptional job of, pivot, of pivoting it to, again, these new parameters that we're working with. So how to do this virtually. Um, they have a really good like FAQ and Q&A section there. So if you have questions, there's lots of information on the website. Um, which you can click on find out more eventually to see. Um, so what else can I tell you? Let me see in my notes here. Um, so I'll just read a little bit from the site. So Future Cities starts with a question. How can we make the world a better, better place? Uh, and then to answer it, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students imagine, research, design, and build cities of the future that showcase their solution to a citywide sustainability issue. So past topics have included stormwater management, urban agriculture, public spaces, and green energy. Um, I will say that um, we have participated in the past as judges. Um, I myself has, have been a judge and some of our engineer volunteers have been judges. Um, and it's amazing to see what these students have come up with. The 2020-2021 theme this year is living on the moon. And so teams will develop and design a futuristic lunar city and provide examples of how the city uses two moon resources to keep its, res its residents safe and healthy. Uh, there's, so the participants have to complete five deliverables. There's an essay, a model, a uh, project plan, presentation video, and a virtual Q&A with judges. So anyways, um, visit the website, check that one out. So we are actually partnering with Engineers Canada to bring this to, um, to scale this even further across Canada. So we will be working on things like what I'm doing now, communication, like just letting all of you know that it's available. Um, teachers, what we will do as well is, um, I mean, you guys are all set up because you have engineers with your class who can support you. Um, but for other teachers that want to participate in the program, we will work on finding them engineer resources to support this um, and then work on things like training and all that kind of stuff. Uh, question from Brittany. Do you know for KCJ virtual classroom visits what tech is required? Um, no, I don't know off the top of my head. Sorry, Brittany. Um, Yeah, I can find out or the um, the contact information for Amanda uh, or Maddie, depending on where you're located or sorry, or Maria. Sorry, I haven't met Maria, <laughs> but um, email them. They're super helpful. I'm sure they can answer your questions. So um, it's just Amanda at kidscogeness.org or Maddie at or uh, Maria at. Um, okay, so highly suggest checking out Future City, uh, Future City Kids Coach Ness. So just wanted to, like I said, just want to kind of highlight those uh, amazing opportunities that are um, that are uh, available to everyone this year. So a bit of a summary to kind of wrap up this section. So running a good lesson. Think about things, uh, think about asking questions instead of just giving the answers. So you'll see in the lesson plans that we have outlined in our program guide, for example, it doesn't tell you, it's not really a, a directed or um, kind of authoritative, like pushing information out. It's really more about pulling, right? What questions can you ask? How can you get people thinking? Think about incorporating learning that engages um, the senses and maybe calls on different types of intelligences. We're going to talk a little bit more about that um, further um, further on in the presentation. But um, when you're looking at the different 
um, options that you have available for these different lessons, these are just some things that you can consider because these are the kinds of things that take it beyond just an activity to a real experience that creates impact with the students. Uh, try to relate this new idea that you're talking to the students about with something they can relate to in your own lives. Most of you are matched with a, um, a teacher and an engineer where you're geographically close together. So maybe there's something going on locally in your own community and you can connect the dots in that way um, for the students and make it really relevant for them. And then, you know, give recognition, encouragement. Um, I would say, again, if you haven't done so, please go check out the virtual connections webinar because there's lots of tips in there on how to do this sort of thing. Um, but the, I guess maybe the important point here is, especially when things don't go as planned, uh, we, talk, we talk a lot about growth mindset. Um, if you have um, attended some of our webinars that we've done in the summer, um, growth mindset is a big one for us. So I'm going to let you in on a secret. Teachers, you probably already know the answer to this, but things never go the way you expect. Never. <laughs> so, so just expect the unexpected um, and use it as a learning opportunity. You know? It's it's way more powerful and it takes pressure off you. You don't have to have everything figured out, right? <laughs> you can figure it out together collectively um, and then encourage self-reflection in students. You don't want to have like criticism, negative self-talk or even crisscross talk, talk happening. Um, we want to, you know, really think about getting them to, to, to continue that reflection and and um, and and stay curious, right? So getting piquing their interest and and um, um, maybe not necessarily having all the answers. Oh, I just realized I didn't maximize my screen again. Hold on, there we go. Okay, so up next is a big question around breaking stereotypes. So how do we break stereotypes about, about engineering? We had lots of comments um, from some of the uh, engineers on the call today. Um, their why behind joining this program is they want to encourage more Black students. They want to encourage more girls to consider STEM uh, careers. So how do we break those stereotypes? So before we get to the how, we think it's really important to always talk about the why. Why um, is messaging important? So these are some of the things we've already kind of covered in some of the other um, conversations and slides already, but um, a lack of understanding about what engineers do and the role that engineering and tech um, play in society, it really just increases that the risk of that divide, like a disconnect between the folks that are developing the solutions and what society really needs. So engineers are figuring out how to solve problems and society is the one that has the problem. So if, if they're not connected well, then the solutions might not necessarily fix the problems to the best um, in, in the way that our society needs, right? So it's really important to understand how that relationship works. Um, when we define uh, what it means to work in engineering, we are reflecting on our profession's purpose, our importance and diversity. Uh, I saw uh, so many comments from the engineers that were chiming in already about loving what they do and they're really passionate uh, about the work that they do. And I think that's one of the things that can separate um, not just engineering, but um, someone that has a career with a purpose and a real uh, connection to that purpose and the why and the impact that you're having separates that from a job. And so when we are using the right messaging, it really helps to get everyone thinking. I was gonna say students, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna say everyone thinking about that. And then just further emphasis on the why of engineering. Um, saw comments from a few folks. I know I personally experienced this as well, but um, 
I chose engineering. Um, one of the reasons I chose engineering because I was told you're just good at math and science, so you should do engineering. And there was no why behind it, like what's possible. And so I really miss connecting to that bigger picture purpose and impact. Um, so, you know, the meaning, the values, the emotions, like it's real people with emotions that are engineers. So just making it human is a way to make it more accessible. <clears throat> So what are kids hearing about engineering these days? Um, it always shocks me, but I still hear it today. And they're the same things that I was hearing when I was a student as well. Um, but there's that the first one there. Well, you're good at math and science, so you should study engineering. Um, engineering equals scientific aptitude. Engineering equals building stuff. And then <laughs> engineers drive trains. We don't get that one as much these days, but it does still happen. And I think the important thing to note here is just that that's not the whole story. So it's not that these things aren't untrue. So yes, if you're, you know, you've got a great scientific aptitude, or yes, if you love building stuff, yes, if you love solving problems, yes, if you're good at math and science, engineering might be an option for you. But it's just... It's just missing so much of the story. It's such a small part of the story that um, that that's what's leading to some of the um, lack of diversity and different ways of thinking that we have in the uh, in in the engineering population. Okay, I'm gonna give myself a second to stop talking for a minute, and I want to I want to hear from all of you again. Um, so please use the chat uh, box and I would like to know, there's a few uh, questions up here. So what are some of the other things that, um, that youth are messages that youth are receiving about engineering today? Kind of those default messages that are maybe a little outdated or maybe again, just not the full story. Uh, where do they get these messages? And what's missing? Like what about, what is it, what is it about them that is, maybe even inaccurate or just incomplete. <clears throat> Engineers only work in factories. Asia. So we try whenever we can to give uh, surveys to students to, and, and we ask them questions like um, use three words to describe engineering or uh, what do you think engineers do? That kind of thing. Um, and we'll do them. Sometimes we've been able to do them um, before, like pre-activity uh, and then post-activity, or maybe at the beginning of the school year and at the end of the school year. And it's really interesting. Like the number one answer we hear is building bridges. Kids think all engineers build bridges for some reason. I've never designed or had anything to do with a bridge, but kids think we build bridges. They work in factories. They work on cars. We hear, we see these all the time. Oh, I received in the past that engineering is a career for men. Wow. Engineers don't work in other, in other industries like banks and hospitals. That's a really interesting one. Um, and again, it's, we love having such a diverse population of volunteers because we have we have volunteers that work at banks and they're engineers and there are things that you can do and you might not consider it. So, I mean, I, I mentioned I have kids. I have grade five, grade seven and grade nine. My grade five and grade seven are boys and they both play hockey and both of them think they're going to go to the NHL <laughs> and um, like they're not. But it's an opportunity to open up a conversation around things like, you know, did you know that as an engineer, you can work in that industry, you could design the scoreboards, you can, you can design the, you know, the, um, the ice and look at how one day there's ice in the rink, and then the next day they convert it to like a basketball court. Engineers work on that kind of stuff. Uh, Brittany's saying engineers get top marks slash are academically strong, missing the importance of communication and creativity in engineering. Yes. So many people are saying engineering just for men. 
Wow. See, again, see, I'm always just shocked to hear it. Like it's so prevalent still today. Focus on construction as opposed to design. Yes. Any teachers have any feedback from things maybe they've heard their students say? Engineering seems to be only for building cars and buildings. Yep. Yeah. We don't think about environmental engineers, water resource engineers, chemical engineers. Yeah, it's interesting. I One of the trends I, I sort of picked up on in the um, uh, surveys that we've done is the students that are seem to be interested in that sort of thing, like better environment or... Um, like homelessness or something like that the when they list the the roles that they the things that they want to do or how they want to help they'll say i want to be um like um like advocate for their them somehow or like they'll they'll take kind of the legal route and they don't really think about engineering as a possibility so as you're typing i'm just going to flip over to the next slide um cuz this is just for your reference, this is a list of ideas, ways we could message other ways, maybe it's a better way to say it, other ways that we could message engineering or integrate into the messaging to just um, make it a, a more complete picture. Okay, you guys are being quiet on the chat. I'm just doing a time check here. I think we're good. All right, well, let's keep going. Um, this is um, a graphic that we like to use. You may have seen this before if you attended some of the other webinars, but again, it just sort of goes back to that why, um, the justification maybe uh, for the modern messaging of engineering or maybe more complete messaging of engineering. So what this is showing is you have that um, subset of students, that A subset of students that are just naturally going to choose engineering. They're, they just know it. Their teachers, you guys, you could probably pick them out like on the after the first week of, of meeting students, you know, that kid's going to be an engineer, right? They just know without any intervention, without anyone telling them anything, maybe without even meeting an engineer, they know that that's what they're going to do. And so messaging is really not important for them. And so when that population becomes the engineering profession, then we're just perpetuating the, st the same messaging or maybe lack thereof messaging. Um, and so we're really missing out on that huge um, full set of talented and capable student population that could choose engineering, but instead are taking a different path. So what could it look like when we integrate a more complete messaging strategy Obviously, we're going to access that full population in some way, the A primes, A double primes, A triple primes. And so when we have that full, um, when we have access to that full population of these talented and capable students, 
feeding into the engineering profession, then in the future, when they become engineers, they're going to perpetuate those Di that diverse messaging and so it's gonna you know it'll it'll just continue on in this in this kind of positive um, direction our approach to messaging so i say our approach to messaging but what we have really done is taken research and put it into action that is one of the things we love to do we love to take data and we love to put it in your hands so that it can be actioned um, so our approach and our messaging um, strategy comes from a study that was done by the National Academy of Engineering. And so it's really a simple formula. So if we take an activity and we add a message that's a positive message about engineering that will enhance the public perception or the use perception of whoever we're talking to, then we're going to have the desired impact. Pretty simple, right? So what are the messages that worked? So luckily for us, the, the National Academy of Engineering, uh, based on their research, they found four that really resonate with young people. So these aren't four that you have to, you know, um, regurgi regurgitate word to, for word. Um, these are just the idea behind how you want to think about integrating um, this type of conversation into the activities you're doing. So the first one is around uh, engineering and technology solutions to a diverse set of 21st century challenges requires a diversity of thinkers. We, I already talked about this. We need different thinkers to solve complex problems. So just that invitation, there's a place for you here. The doors are open. You're welcome to come and check it out. Uh, Number two is engineering and technology shape the world around us from yesterday to today to tomorrow. So the idea here is around um, kind of pulling back the curtains and exposing really what is going on. Well, what is engineering? We don't want it to be a stealth profession anymore. Let's actually call out how engineering and technology have truly shaped our world. And that can be from, you know, our world, especially for a student, can be from you know, what's going on in the class that day or what's going on in their community um, to even those bigger um, global problems that are happening. Uh, and number three, engineering and technology apply creativity. Someone mentioned creativity in the in the chat um, and imagination to turn ideas into reality. One of my three kids and likes to do this all the time. He'll say to me, mom, imagine if we had this thing and it did this and then it did this and then it turned into this. Like I can't even I can't even regurgitate what he says because his ideas are just like so off the wall. But I love it. Right. And, and you can say to someone, well, that's so cool. Did you know that's what engineers do? They take ideas and they get to make them real life. Uh, and then the number four, the last one um, is just connecting um, that again engineering to that like real people real world stuff so engineering and technology are essential to the safety health happiness comfort and efficiency of our friends family distant neighbors so locally and globally people working for people and i think um again marketing opportunity here engineering tends to be centered around things um not people and really engineers solve problems for people. Um, so anyways, uh, so engineers and technologists make a world of difference. So I encourage you to kind of figure out a, a way to kind of mark these um, and come back to them or, or think about, you know, kind of have a bit of a checklist as you're designing an experience for uh, the students. Um, how many of these can you check off or at least one you can integrate in some way? So in so just building on this idea of integrating messaging into activities, um, I mentioned bridge building. It tends to be a very popular activity, hence why I think a lot of kids associate engineering with building bridges. Um, we see a lot of we see a lot of bridge building activities. Um, so 
that that's fine. You know, there's some great learning that can happen. It is fun. It is really accessible. Um, but how can we go beyond just, you know, kids building a bridge and then seeing how much weight it can hold before it collapses? Like that's only going to create so much impact. But that's the kind of activity where you're only going to access that small, like a population of kids that already know that they're going to that they want to go into engineering. They'll love that kind of an activity. So how can we take a bridge building activity and access that full population of talented and capable students? Well, we can use our formula, activity plus message, to achieve that impact. Um, another way to think about this is maybe through storytelling. So if we put a story around what's happening, um, we make it real, relevant, um, make it something that maybe maybe it's a problem that's actually happening in their their local community then those kids that um you know want to want to help people in some other way um, and don't necessarily associate engineering with helping people the those kids will um maybe look up and and maybe open an ear or two and start to listen uh and and pay a little closer attention and maybe we'll open some minds so with the bridge building activity um, this was a really great example, um, this city of trail. Um, and so all that was done here was that um, this story was put around the activity. So you can talk about how having a, you know, designing and building a bridge for this community of trail, how it, it will affect that community. So you, I mean, you can even put it, put um, more problems into it. So maybe there's, a, this is a really relevant one to do in the spring, especially if there's a lot of flooding. Um, we had that a couple of years ago. So, you know, talk about uh, this Columbia River, maybe in the spring gets really flooded. And so the, um, the residents of this town that causes all sorts of problems. So you can talk about the different kinds of challenges that go along with that. And so what are the parameters that you need to consider for designing this bridge? And, and really our job as, as engineers is to help these people and help um, alleviate or eliminate these problems. So just wanted to give you kind of a, um, uh, a sample or an idea of how to integrate uh, messaging and activities together. All right, so in summary, um, with uh, respect to messaging, so hopefully, <laughs> I mean, I, I think a lot of times the, the volunteers that we have and the teachers that are with us today, they kind of already get the importance of having good messaging. So um, hopefully <laughs> I wasn't, uh, you got something out of that part of the talk. Um, but then thinking about, you know, understanding that audience, what's gonna be real and relevant for them and that magical formula, um, of activity plus message equals impact. Um, so I just wanted to take a, a few slides here and talk about um, the EIR program and EDI or equity, diversity and inclusion. So just to start off with, and by the way, I love this um, picture, the sticky note up here. This was from a student at actually a local, a school local to me uh, that I was um, fortunate enough to be able to visit for some, um, for some activities that they were doing. And this was one of the sticky notes that one of the students wrote at the end of the event. Uh, Liam wrote, I learned you don't have to be a genius, spelled wrong, <laughs> to be, and then corrected, to be an engineer. So a great example of breaking stereotypes. Um, obviously, he thought that in the past you had to be super smart and anyways. Um, so I just wanted to kind of flag that. But, um, but, but with respect to EDI, we want to be thinking about this because, again, going to the idea of um, and, the, and the goal of making ex engineering accessible to everyone, and really we mean everyone, diverse um, genders, diverse thinkers, diverse races, diverse beliefs, it doesn't matter. We need that diversity in the profession to, to be successful and to represent the society that we're trying to solve problems for. So one of the things that you can do, and 
uh, is just start off, you know, with yourself, right? What, what are your own biases? Sometimes we don't even pause to think about that. Um, and how those biases might affect the experience that we're having on others. Like we all have grown up in our own, you know, communities, had our own experiences. So we, we have biases. It's, it's just part of who we are. Um, I studied engineering. I worked in the engineering profession for quite some time. I work with a lot of engineers now. So I am most likely biased towards the engineers today on this call. So teachers, I apologize if I have made you feel left out in, in any ways. I, I try my best to, to equally distribute my comments and questions to the teachers and the engineers. But I know that as a, you know, because of my experiences and because um, I studied engineering, I do have that as a bias. Um, so something simple as that, right? Just acknowledging what kind of biases you might have and then thinking about how they might ex affect um, those experiences. We go into a lot more detail about um, equity, diversity, inclusion, and how to um, integrate it into the whole experience and the messaging in our webinar on diverse and inclusive messaging. Again, we've taken some research and turned it into action in this webinar. There are some real tips. Um, I don't even want to call them tricks, like actions that you can take that are very simple that you can apply to um, to the um, to the program, to the to the visits that you're that you're having. So if you miss that or if you weren't able to attend that webinar that happened back in July, I highly recommend you check that one out. And then so just to expand on this thought a little when it comes to diversity, like in engineering, there's a lot of conversation around gender balance. So a lot of folks tend to immediately um, jump to how many girls are engineers and how many boys are engineers. And for us, it goes so far beyond that. Having a profession that's equally distributed between women and men is, is okay. But what we're looking for is diverse thinkers, right? Diverse experiences, diverse um communication styles diverse you know you name it so there's other ways that we can think about diversity we have different learning styles so when we're designing an experience we want to keep this in mind and teachers this is um something that you can really um support your eirs with you know your students obviously better than they do so if you know that they're going to um uh, react really well to a certain uh, type of learning, then you can let that engineer know or give them feedback. If if they're only doing, for example, they just are doing presentations all the time and you see the students are just tuning out and this is just not working for them, you know, constructive criticism is always welcome and, uh, and, and, it, and then we can apply those learnings to improve those experiences going forward. Um, and then intelligences. So there's you know, we we are diverse in the way we um, express our intelligence. So there's some information up here. I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on this in any way, um, but there are many ways we can express these the the, the intelligence, like linguistic, uh, interpersonal, musical, existential. So just because um, a student might not appear to be getting something in the way you expected um, doesn't mean that uh, it's not getting through. They might just be expressing it in a different way, um, a more diverse way than you're used to, and that's awesome. And then just a couple EDI best practices. Again, I highly suggest you go and check out the Diverse and Inclusive Messaging webinar to get the details on this. Um, but Here's some just high level stuff. Obviously, communication is key, like especially in the times of these virtual environments we're working in. We can't communicate enough, I would say. Um, be realistic. A lot of times we'll just take on more than we can chew, um, overcommit, um, have 
unrealistic expectations, maybe expect everything's going to go perfectly and smoothly. And like I already told you, it's not. <laughs> so just be realistic. Uh, do your best to plan ahead, though. Um, so do your homework, figure out the logistics you need so that we don't have to be, you know, uh, on the, the day of the event, you're not struggling with that and getting flustered. And then then you kind of default back into those, maybe some of those um, those biases that you have will start to come through. Um, but then have some, have some fun with it, right? So be creative. That creativity is going to come through. Your passions will come through and that energy is what kids will pick up on. Um, and then teamwork, right? So we don't have to go this alone. Your teacher, your engineers, you are a team with your students even working together. They're part of the team too. And I've said this already, but you're part of um, the whole engineer in residence program as a team. We're all here to support everyone as best we can. Um, so, so really have some fun. Uh, there was a really cool idea that one of the um, more experienced engineer in residence volunteers um, brought up to me and I thought I would share it here because why not? We're all about sharing. Um, so she was telling me about an experience that she had and this is, again, pre-COVID times when she was able to visit her class. Uh, she had a, a class of grade four students, and she liked to do activities with them that were edible. So I think in the, the one case, they were making Rice Krispie squares. Um, and she was able to integrate all some awesome messaging and science and like chemistry stuff into that. Um, and then obviously it's a lot of fun for the students because they get to eat their treats at the end. Um, but she did this activity. It just happened to be around the same time as um, Ramadan. So what she realized was that with her grade four students, um, this is for some of those grade four students the first time they're participating in Ramadan. And so it was really hard for them to have to sit back and watch the rest of the class enjoy these fun, delicious treats because they couldn't participate. So what she did as a sort of best practice is she's made a list of culturally significant dates so that for, and, and specific to those students that are, um, that you're working with that year, so that now she knows and she can take that into consideration when she's planning those activities. All right, so switching gears. <laughs> um, in terms of logistics and support that we can offer um, and that you can access, here's a an overview of what of what that looks like. So uh, for the volunteers we have on the call with us, um, you do have to have a police check. Um, and so that police check, um, usually comes with a, a bit of a price tag. It, it depends on which police district you're in. They all um, operate a little bit differently. They all charge a little bit differently. Some of them can will even do them for free sometimes. It really just depends. Um, but the policy, our policy is that we will reimburse the um, cost or the expenses of that um, police check for your first time only. If you decide to stay on with the program and you have to get a police check done uh, in subsequent years, then you will have to incur that cost yourself. Um, the forms to access that um, reimbursement are on the resources page. If you remember, I scrolled down to the bottom and there was two forms that were listed. So that's where you find that. Um, and you do have to get those submitted by the end of December um, because we just need them all in so we can process them. Um, we also uh, really want to, uh, I said this in the beginning, one of our goals is to make this program accessible. That's why it's offered free of charge to um, all the schools and teachers and students. Um, and then we recognize that there are certain um, expenses that might come up to be able to deliver activities to the students. And so we do offer a small budget that the engineers can spend on their class 
um, per program year. So you can spend up to, well, we will cover up to $300 per classroom um, on uh, consumables, basically. So like the popsicle sticks, or if you're doing like spaghetti and marshmallows to build structures and that sort of thing. So we will cover that. So save your receipts. Um, those also get submitted online and we process those every summer. So save them. We bulk process those in July and August. Uh, the, so that submission deadline is July 31st. Uh, and then the last one, uh, in terms of support, now this changes a little bit every year. In the past, they have also offered financial support. I'm not sure what they're doing this year, but um, NEM, which is National Engineering Month, um, that uh, in the past has, has had some really excellent resources that we've encouraged everyone to take advantage of. Um, so NEM is um, organized by Engineers Canada. It happens every March in Canada. Um, in Ontario, PEO oversees, uh, sorry, not just PEO, PEO, and there's like a whole steering team of organizations that oversee the uh, activities that happen every March. And so they usually have um, some good funding in place and make some resources available. So I recommend you check that out. Their website is just NEM, uh, NEM online. Oh, sorry. I'm forgetting the, I'm forgetting the URL at the moment, but I can share that with everyone. Um, and keep an eye on that because March comes fast. <laughs> Uh, faster than we we care in some cases, um, but keep an eye on um, as to what they're planning. Right now is the time of year they're usually just sort of figuring out what's going to happen for the coming March. Um, so uh, good to just like I said, keep an eye on it. Uh, however, I will mention that it's a great time for the Water for the World workshop. Um, if anyone's experienced this. Um, activity. It's awesome. This one, it's connected. <laughs> I've mentioned it in this section with NEM because it it has started as a NEM event years and years ago, um, but it's sort of um, gone beyond NEM. Uh, it is uh, run by the Engineers Without Borders Toronto Pro Chapter. And they've designed this workshop. So there's like the, the lesson plan with it. And you get the, um, I think they do training for all the volunteers on how to run the workshop. And then they send out kits because they get funding from NEM. Um, so they send out these kits. And essentially, the students are designing a water filter. Like if I boil it down to the bare bones, that's what they're doing. They're designing a water filter. Um, but the story that they have around it, uh, you, I think you get a presentation slide deck with it as well. So this story that they have around it integrates so many awesome um, other stuff. Uh, literacy, there's like financial literacy in there. There's like understanding global um, GDP. Like it's really, really well done. Um, and again, like I said, in the past, they have done this one in March. They usually reach out to us because they know we have um, an awesome network of uh, engineers and, and teachers, and they want to make that accessible. Um, I haven't, they haven't reached out just yet. I think they're still working on pivoting from what they used to do to working with these new parameters now, but I know they are working on it. So that's one to watch out for. And as more information becomes available for that one. Um, I will make sure to pass it along to everyone. Um, oh, I've got one more slide here. Other support that we can offer. Um, so again, if, if you didn't see something here and you think that it might help, please ask. We are open to supporting you in any way that we can. So here's just some other stuff that, that we do to support the program, to support you. Um, so there's like the orientation sessions. Uh, we do have a newsletter if you'd like to subscribe to the newsletter. Um, we've got all our guidelines and webinars. Uh, I already mentioned the LinkedIn group and our social platforms, the website. 
uh, engineers, if you need some help with your workplace, if you need to be able to, you know, give maybe a letter to your manager explaining what you're doing to let you off work for um, some time to do the program, we can help you with that. Um, or if they just like to know more about the program, maybe there's other engineers that you work with that would like to get involved. We have we have um, some uh, like brochures and flyers and pamphlets and stuff that we can share. So, and like I said, if it's not here, if you're not seeing something, then please um, just ask. So just so to wrap up kind of the overview of what we've talked about for the last couple hours um, and a few kind of to do's, I guess, um, for, for you or takeaways, maybe is a good way to put it. Um, here are some things that you can do right now. If you haven't already, um, book your first meeting. So, uh, teachers on the call, uh, reach out to your engineer. If they're with us today. Awesome. Um, if you see their name, you can like direct chat to them. Um, and try and get that first meeting on the calendar so that you can start that communication, start that planning. Uh, easy one, just connect with us online. Facebook, Twitter, the LinkedIn group. That's a really easy one you can do. Um, and, you know, exchange your phone numbers, emails, whatever. So what we're going to do now is take a uh, break. Um, if you plan this to be on the call with your um, partner with your EIR or with your um, teacher, give them a call. <laughs> Take uh, 20 minutes, say hello, um, and maybe you, you can even um, start some planning. And then we will, what we'll do is I'm going to just, we'll just pause. I'll pause the recording and then uh, we'll take a little break. And then I'll come, we'll come back and have. Um, just some open time for uh, for Q and A. So before I do that, I see there's some chats or some questions in the chat. Uh, so let me just do a quick scan. Oh, good point, Brittany. Some Brittany's just saying when we were talking about food, some cultures don't eat eat marshmallows, so I buy the vegan ones. Yeah, there's definitely some food restrictions um, that you need to take into consideration. Um, Aisha, do I need to do a police check every year? So general rule of thumb is yes, you do, but please check that check with your teacher so that they can give you clear direction on that. Um, oh, Brittany, thank you for answering. Yes, yes, schools usually ask for a police check that's been completed within the last six to 12 months. Each school board manages it a little bit differently. So best to just check with your teacher. All right, so before um, I wrap up for the break is there any um immediate questions oh someone joined late oh i might have missed the information we will only do virtual ses sessions with the kids due to covid is this right yes yes so um i if you're joining late you might have missed it but we do have a specific webinar on virtual connections um, we called it COVID-19 and beyond. So um, I can send you that link. Actually, maybe I'll just put it in the chat um, so that everyone has access to that link. And I highly, highly recommend you check that out. Okay, so I'm gonna just pause the recording for now. Continue if you liked. I'll keep an eye on the chat if you have other questions there. Um, what we'll do is come back at, Oh, it's 12 o'clock. Okay, perfect. Look at um, we will come back to um, together at 1230. And I'll just open the lines for some Q&A. Oh, uh, one more question. What strategies do you suggest if you can't get a hold of your partner? Um, so I mean, it, it, it depends on the time of year. So if you're an engineer and you're trying to reach your teacher partner over the summer, it's not uncommon that teachers aren't checking their work email during the summer break. So follow up with them again around now because some of them, um, you know, they're just getting caught up on that communication. And in particular, this um, this year has been, you know, just so overwhelming with so many last minute changes. 
Um, teachers, I honestly can't imagine what you've had to go through in terms of all the changes that have had to happen so fast. So, um, so grateful to have you uh, joining us today, but um, be patient, try reaching out to them again. Um, we've had a few cases, like a few, a few cases where there have been some unusual firewalls in place where um, teachers aren't receiving an email or maybe it's going into a junk mail. So try calling. Um, if you can, you know, call the school. Uh, I can help with a phone number if that, if you need that. And if you still can't get a hold of that, um, uh, the particular person, in this case, I'm kind of doing it as an engineer trying to reach a teacher, just let us know uh, and we can try and intervene. And teachers, if you're not if you're not able to get in touch with your engineer, if you've been trying and they're not being responsive, um, again, just please let us know and we can um, intervene and see what's going on. Okay, well, welcome back. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, about this slide. I threw this up here in the break um, in case anyone did connect uh, over the last 30 minutes. These are just some suggested questions to guide that conversation. So it's there. Again, you'll have full access to all these slides and the replay if you want to use these to um, as a bit of an agenda for your meetings or whatever. But I just really wanted to leave some time for Q&A. Um, we are, I mean, we have a relatively manageable amount of folks here now. So if you want to um, take yourself off chat and ask your question, you can do that or um, pop it into the chat box and I will do my best to respond. And if it's all quiet, that's okay too. I'm gonna assume that I did such an amazing job of covering all the answers <laughs> to everyone's questions that nobody's got any new ones. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. You know, there's there's always questions. So again, at any time, please reach out. We do really rely on you to give us to reach back out to us if something's not going right or you're not sure about something um, because we're not there in front of you we don't know um, and we will do our best to push communications towards you so when like I said when things come across my desk or my inbox that look really interesting I'll be sh I will be sure to share those um, and post them out on our, our um, social platforms and LinkedIn groups and stuff as well. So maybe I'll just ask, how is everyone feeling about this, um, the new parameters we're working with this year? Have you got thoughts on that? Um, maybe actually what I'll do is I'll take a second and just tell you a little I'll give you a little behind the scenes intel so um, because we're largely made up of uh, volunteers and we are a small um, program office team we do have some other um, volunteers that wanted to contribute to the program in other ways so what we did um, about a year maybe a year and a half ago now, was we have set up an EIR advisory board. And I think there's about maybe 15 or so folks. We connect on a quarterly basis. And what we've done is that group has broken out into working groups that are working on things that are aligned with the strategic goals of the program and adding value back in. So 
One of the more active groups at the moment is working on content. Um, and so they just recognize that there's still opportunities. I know I shared some of the resources with you today through our program guide and some of the other websites we, we like and the, um, the other organizations that are doing some really great stuff, but there's still opportunity for improvement and there's so many um, folks doing so many great things that we know we can continue to be you know, innovative and, and share even further. So that group is focused on making, pu pulling that content together. They've already been um, trialing some, some stuff out on kind of a small scale, but they're looking at being, bringing that to the broader um, uh, province, at kind of a provincial level for that information. And of course, at the moment, they have shifted their focus to COVID appropriate um, or relevant or more accessible content. So stay tuned for that. As information comes out, I will communicate um, more on that as well. Um, oh, there was a question from Jessica. Have you had a chance to connect with the teachers about online versus classroom learning? So Jessica, it's, um, it's specific to the school board. Each school board has, um, has their own, I'll say rules in place, their own, um, their own plan for how they are doing uh, back to school this year or how are they are doing school this year. And so the situation could look a little bit differently re really for everyone. So um, as far as I'm aware, the, um, the school boards aren't letting external visitors come into the classrooms to do in-person visits. So we will have to um, th and that's why we've had to pivot to this virtual um, virtual environment. Um, however, there's you know there's there's different ways. It, it can still look differently depending on the situation. So you could be um, in a situation where you have kids in a class um, with a teacher, and so there's certain things you can do with those parameters. So in that case, for example, you might be able to um, coordinate with the teacher to bring in the materials that are needed. And then the, um, the engineer can connect in through maybe a smart board or some um, sort of technology that the teacher has available in the classroom to help facilitate that lesson live. Um, or you could maybe do a recorded, um, a recording of some sort of information you want to give out. You could do share your screen and do a presentation, that sort of thing. Um, but then there's also some students that are that have chosen to stay home. So there are um, teachers that are facilitating classes with kids that are are learning from home. So um, there's still things we can do there too. That's the situation that we experienced last spring. And so we, what we observed from um, some of our volunteers and our teachers was, was that the um, engineers were doing some really simple things with the students that um, were accessing materials they would have already had at home. So I'll give you an example. One of the engineers, um, I think the teacher had requested to do a, um, an activity on light or ref refraction. And so they did something simple with a, a glass of water. Everyone had a glass and they took a pencil and stuck the pencil in and could see how it was bending in the water. They had a younger group of students. So think, learn about the parameters that you're working with and then you can figure out how to tweak and try different things. And then collect feedback, like ask the students how it's going, ask the teacher how it's going, what can be done differently. Uh, Bruce is saying uh, the school board that I'm working with won't let me on site. Uh, I suggested that I can set up outside in the field behind the school, but that's not allowed either. Yeah, there's some, um, I, 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 I um, second what you're suggesting there, Bruce, is like check in with your teachers, see what's allowed. Every um, school board has a certain plan in place. Um, like I can tell you at my, my children's elementary school, when they're outside for recess, they have to stay with their own cohorted class. So they're only allowed to be in certain sections of the 
of the yard outside too. So you got to figure it out. It's really, you have to talk to the teacher and see what um, is going on. And teachers, please talk to your engineers too and see what they're comfortable with as things continue to change and maybe things will open up a little or maybe things will um, become more strict. Um, see what they're, what they're comfortable with. Even if things do open up, that engineer might have, um, might not be comfortable coming into the school. Um, they're, anyways, you know, everyone's situation is different. I know this is um, really the, probably the biggest thing on everyone's mind at the moment, um, naturally. But uh, like I said, I'm so grateful that our program is made up of natural born problem solvers. So I really encourage you to just think about it that way. These are some new parameters we're working with um, and new problem to solve. <laughs> Looks like there's a couple of people just joining back in again. So we're just doing open Q&A if you have questions. Um, please pop them in the chat box um, or if you like take yourself off mute and ask away teamwork yes Asia teamwork is key and, and really think of the team as more broadly than just you and your partner you have us as the program office to support you you have the students they're part of the team too please collect their feedback and um and action on it and then the whole broader eir community Uh, Bruce has just added in a comment, a thought about engineering. As I hear you talk about it, engineering is pervasive. <laughs> yes, it is everywhere. It really is. Like you can really take um, any situation and look at it through an engineering lens um, and maybe open some eyes and minds to what's possible. One neat example. Um, and I'm forgetting the exact context on this one, but it was someone was telling me, I think, about a student who was particularly interested in fashion or the fashion industry, something like that. And and what they really knew about it was like designers, right? Like designing clothes and that that's the fashion industry. And the the person I was talking to, um, I think was an engineer. And so they were able to um open a dialogue with this particular student about how engineering plays a role in the fashion industry too and did you think about the different materials you have to consider and um they're just so much beyond just designers and it was really eye-opening for that student to think about the possibilities right if i can't maybe make it as a designer maybe there's some other way that i can connect to these industries um, there's a, I've, I've written a few blog posts and, and done some interviews where I've chatted with folks about um, the question, um, what what do you want to do or what you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said before, I I personally do not like that question. I have a really negative reaction to it myself. I never knew as a young person what I wanted to be when I grow up. So when someone asked me that question, I felt almost embarrassed, like, oh, geez, I don't know. Like, oh, may maybe I'm supposed to know, so I should just give an answer, right? <laughs> Trying to be a good student. And and so I suggested that, you know, there's there's a better question to ask. Instead of what do you want to be when you grow up, you can talk to kids about what's a problem you want to solve. Or what's a challenge you think you'd like to help overcome? And you can have some um, really, really awesome conversations that way. Um, yeah, or what are you passionate about too? Yeah, that's a really good one. Um, and it might be something like 
depending on who you're talking to, right? It might be something like, well, I'm really passionate about keep, keeping my room clean so my mom doesn't bug me. And, and that's okay. That's relevant for those kids, right? That's that's the world that they're living in. But you can talk about that and you can um, think about maybe there's different um, technology that could help with that or there's different systems that could be set up. And engineers like to think a lot about systems and solve problems. So um, I was saying, I think there's a lot of opportunity to reflect on engineering in relation to COVID challenges. Yes, yes, <laughs> I should agree. I agree 100%. This is a complex global problem that is relevant to everyone right now. And there is a lot of work that is happening um, related to engineering that can be talked about. So um, I think that's a great one. Um, back in the spring, we did a few little, um, I don't even know what to call them, little mini YouTube videos uh, that we, where we try to pick up um, different COVID-related um, challenges that were happening and then look at it through an engineering lens and then produce these little short YouTube videos on um, you know, how that all links together with engineering. So that's up on our YouTube channel. If anyone's interested in looking at that, I will show you. Maybe I can find it here. So I'm not going to say that we're YouTubers in any way, but we tend to just store our videos on YouTube. So it is a good resource. <laughs> if you want to subscribe, you'll see when new stuff gets added. Um, let's see, did I do it? I think it's maybe a playlist. So you can see like we have things organized by playlist. So all of our 2020 summer webinars are in the 2020 summer webinar playlist. So there was the intro to the EIR program for teachers, for EIRs. We did how to tell your engineering story, uh, diverse and inclusive messaging. I talked about that one. And then that virtual connections webinar is here as well. And then here's the, oh, that's what we called them, NG News. <laughs> so here are the NG News episodes that we produced. I think we did 11, yeah, 11 of them. So we tried to keep them relatively short, like five to 10 minutes. This one was an hour long interview with someone. <laughs> so that one's a bit of an outlier. But you can see, so like, for example, this one, episode three, car parts for face masks. So we featured um, a company uh, here in Ontario that has pivoted from um, making car parts. They make the foam that goes in to different parts of your car, like the seats and the headliner and that sort of stuff. And they pivoted from making those car parts to using their foam to make face masks. So that was kind of a really neat story. So maybe you can find some sources of inspiration there. Uh, can we, yes, you can use the EIR logo in your presentation. Uh, oh, sorry, you're asking me that privately, but Timmy was asking, can we use the EIR logo in our presentations? Yes, you can. Actually, I'm going to give myself an action item to, I will set up um, like a media logo um, section on the resources page so that if anyone wants to download that stuff, you can. Okay. Any other questions? Let's see if there's anything else to show you on our YouTube. You can go back and look at past um, years summer webinars. They're largely um, the same year over year. We just tweak them each year with the relevant data. We we refresh them a little bit. Um, but it's usually different people doing them every time, so you get to hear different stories different insights. 
Um, there's some some videos on here from National Engineering Month. I talked about National Engineering Month um, a little bit earlier. We were a lot more involved with National Engineering Month historically, so that's why all that's on there. But anyways, I think the most relevant for you will be the 2020 webinars. Oh, I'll mention EOT Lunch and Learns. Um, this is something new. We just launched this in August. We will be doing monthly lunch and learns. Now, I will say that the intended audience for these lunch and learns is our EOT, like our engineers of tomorrow, our EOT community more broadly. It's not just for EIRs. Um, so if you're going to this, um, if you're registering for these events, thinking that it's going to be something that's specific for um, uh, application in the K-12 classroom. It's, it's beyond that. Um, but it's designed to be, and part of the reason we, we did this was because we heard from our community that they wanted to kind of connect and engage um, even further. We are quite active on LinkedIn. So um, there's so much, you know, there's only so much connecting you can do on LinkedIn and you have, you know, conversations and share articles and that sort of thing happening there. But um, we wanted to try and satisfy that need. So our solution or our, our first attempt at a solution to that is to do EOT lunch and learns. So like I said, these will happen on a monthly basis. We'll send out um, invitations or we'll make the, you know, we'll, we'll advertise them on our social media platforms so you know that they're coming up. And what we'll do is um, feature just members of our community um, and have a conversation about what they're doing and um, why it's relevant. And it'll obviously kind of all be connected to that um, strategic messaging that, that we really love. Um, and so just if you're interested in connecting up with our EOT community more broadly, that might be something that you want to um, look at in the future. We're not going to do one in September because we've got um, the orientation happening this weekend and next weekend. So we're a little bit busy this month, um, but we'll pick that up again in October. So I'll just, I just switched over to the next slide, but feel free to keep, if you have other questions, just stick them in the chat there. Um, but I just really wanted to say thank you again to everyone for taking some time out of your valuable weekend hours to uh, listen in and engage with us and be a part of the EIR program. We're really excited to be working with all of you um, and we're looking forward to experiencing the year with you. Please keep us in the loop. Um, we do uh, get a little jealous that we're not always able to be there with you. Um, I know it's not in person this year, but even at your um, at your virtual visits or your events that you're you're having. So we do always appreciate um, hearing about all the stories. Um, the success stories and even, you know, getting us involved when we need to overcome some challenges together too. Um, but we love it when you can share pictures with us, um, when you can give us some um, insights into what your students are saying. Uh, that's always really, you know, just great for us to have that, um, that insight and we really appreciate it as well. So um, please do that. You're welcome to tag us. Um, if you're posting anything on the your social platforms, please tag us so that we can uh, see it and share it and re-share, tweet, whatever. It, um, but yeah, thank you again. And, and um, like I said, any questions, please ask. <laughs>